Okay, welcome economics. Uh, this lesson will be uh, 6.3, which is the Federal Reserve System. Uh, so we're gonna talk a little bit more, dive even more in depth in the uh, history of banking. Uh, we're gonna look specifically at the structure of the Federal Reserve System uh, and how their policies can affect the money supply and, and money supply then affects the economy and how the Federal Reserve System can carry out monetary policy and, the, and they've got just some like basic tools in their arsenal that they can use. So what is monetary policy? Uh, when you hear monetary policy versus fiscal policy, this deals with the Federal Reserve and they have a direct lever and, and can influence uh, the level of GDP and inflation in the economy. Uh, reserves. Each bank is required to keep a certain amount of ca like cash on hand um, as opposed to lending it out. So if I'm a bank and I take in $100,000 in deposits, I can't loan out $100,000. I need to keep, say, $10,000 of it in reserve and I can loan out the $90,000 and there's a specific percentage or ratio of uh, deposits that has to be kept in reserve. And that takes us to the next one, which is the reserve requirement. Um, this is the amount of, zer of, of reserves that banks have to keep on hand. And it's a ratio or a percent, it's not a dollar amount. Check clearing, um, this is the process by which a bank records whose account gives up the money and whose account uh, receives the money when you write a check. This is a dying art because very few people write checks anymore. Uh, but you used to hear like people bouncing a check or the check didn't clear. And the reason is you write the check and when it got sent in, the bank would say, no, there's not any funds to pay this. So the check didn't clear. When the check cleared, the bank was signing off. Yes, we're transferring these funds and, and it's paid. A uh, bank holding company is that this is any company that owns more than one bank. Your federal funds rate, this is the interest rate that banks can charge each other for loans. So First Horizon wants to borrow uh, or give a loan to uh, Bank of America, there's a federal funds rate, which is obviously cheaper than what we're gonna be able to do stuff for. The discount rate is gonna be if, say, First Horizon has to borrow money from the Federal Reserve, how much, what's the interest gonna be for there? Um, so, you know, we've all had this scenario where we're out and we don't have any money. Um, we try to go to an ATM to get cash out, but you know, what if all of a sudden you went to the ATM and, and you know, you've got, you know, hundred dollars in your account, but the ATM is saying, uh, it doesn't have any more money. Can't give you any money. We're out, we're, we're, we're out of cash. We've given out all the cash we can today. You're too late. I mean, what what would you do? Um, so one of the things that banks can do if they've given out all the reserves, somebody comes in and wants their cash, they can take out a loan from the Federal Reserve or another bank to tide them over until they get other deposits in. Now, when we talk about this central bank, the central bank has several functions and one is to regulate the money supply. When we regulate the money supply, it gives us control over inflation and, and we wanna keep inflation down. We wanna to try to keep it under 2%. It also uh, ensures the availability of credit so that people uh, can borrow money to purchase houses and cars and things like that. Uh, it also oversees the banking system, you know, the entire banking system to make sure that banks are stable, they're secure, uh, banks have adequate capital to run, and they also manage our government's funds. So it's kind of like the government's bank. They handle when you pay taxes, they handle the collection of those government funds. If you're getting a refund, they're the ones that pay it back. Um, and they also sell government securities. So those U.S. Treasury bonds that fund our national debt, Central Bank is the one selling them. Now, we have had, in the history of the U.S., we've had uh, financial panics in banking. And basically what happens, these run on the banks, 
uh, they happen because there'll be some kind of speculation. Somebody's out there trying to predict, oh, profit soar, speculators enter the market. Oh my gosh, profits are going up so high that we're going to have a recession and you know, it, it's coming, it's coming and, and people freak out and this bubble bursts. Uh, everybody loses confidence in the economy or the bank. And so they all rush to the bank and, and they want to hold the cash. They want to cash money out of the bank. And um, some banks will then start to freak out and they'll call in credit. Um, and, and it creates this panic because then everybody's withdrawing their money. So, you know, everybody feels like they have to do it. And then we end up in this, this financial crisis <coughs> that which we have to recover from or the government has to rescue us from. Um, the history of the Federal Reserve System. We had the panic of 1907. Again, we had the run on banks. Um, and so that allowed, uh, Congress decided to pass the Federal Reserve Act of 1913. Uh, and we've got the Federal Reserve, we call it the Fed. That's like the slang for it. Um, there's 12 independent regional banks and those banks can lend each other money if they need to. This is Woodrow Wilson. He actually signed the Federal Reserve Act into law in 1913, prior to the Great Depression. And this is a very, very great uh, figure here that shows 1929 is the start of the Great Depression. So you can see, you know, the bank failures, they start to go up. Then they kind of go down again, you know, towards the end of the Great Depression, and then they skyrocket here right at the end, 1933. But then they fall back down, and look how minimal the bank failures are. Now, remember, we've got FDIC insured around here. Um, so with this FDIC insured, that's helping people uh, feel more confident in the banks and not want to do uh, those run-on banks. Now, the structure of the Federal Reserve System um, looks a lot like this. Okay, advance forward. You've got your seven members, your board of governors. Okay, then you have your 12 district reserve banks here, the white ones. And then there's about 2,600 member banks and another 25,000 uh, depository banks where, where you do that. Um, and so this is how it is set up. Okay, so if we have a nationally chartered bank in our community, it's going to fit right in here in these member banks. Uh, this is Janet Yellen. She was the chairman of the Federal Reserve in 2014. I'm just sure you're all excited that you got to see her. Yes. Um, here's the structure of the Federal Reserve System. So you can see here's the regions of the United States and where a Federal Reserve Bank is located for that region. Um, the Board of Governors obviously are up here where the star is in Washington, DC. We've got our 12 dif different districts. Um, and the New York Reserve has the smallest geographic area, but it also contains the largest assets of the 12 banks. Um, so, uh, Here's a scenario, you've got a summer job, it's going great, you like the pay, um, but you only get paid once a month. So while you're waiting for four or five weeks to go by to get your first paycheck, what are you gonna do for money? So when you finally get that paycheck, you run to the bank, you cash it, and the, the cashier is gonna say, well, I can't give you the money right now. We gotta wait a couple of days for the check to clear. Um, you're probably going to be really upset. You've already waited four to five weeks to get this check, and now you got to wait a couple of other days. Uh, yeah, uh, modern day banking has really helped that with the internet and with everything. It doesn't take as long for things to clear. Uh, mobile banking has made it, it better. Uh, you can do transfers from account to account, and they tend to go in instantly. Uh, credit card payments tend, tend to pay things very quickly, debit card payments. Um, and so with all this mobile banking we've got now, this is one of the roles of the Federal Reserve as well. Now this is interesting. Get yourself a, a dollar and you can use this slide right here. If you look, here's our Federal Reserve note that says this is fiat money. 
We've got our statement that says this is legal tender, United States of America. Um, if you look in here, we've got the seal. Each one has a unique serial number, all that good stuff. But it's right here. Oh, hold on, I need my pen. I messed that up. Uh, let's do blue. If you look right here, that says E... I can't get it to it. It's got to be E5. Um, so that tells me that this dollar bill was issued by the Richmond Federal Reserve Bank. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of cool. You can pull one out and pull if got any cash on you and go, ah, oh, this was on the Federal Reserve in Dallas. It's a K it, or I, it's Minneapolis. It's really kind of cool. Um, so the Federal Reserve provides services to uh, other banks in the nation. It can help clear checks. It can uh, loan them money in times that they need. Um, it also coordinates activities and, and regulates things in state and federal. Um, so if we look here, these are non-cash transactions. So I'm not actually handing somebody cash and they're handing it back to me. Um, if you look from 2000 to 2006, the number of people writing checks has, has been cut in half. And a lot of that is due to this right here, debit cards. We're moving away from checks and we're going to debit cards. And look, debit cards have gone up over 400%, probably 450%. It's easier. People like using a debit card. Uh, credit cards, you can see they have increased, not much since 2006. Um, because again, a, a credit card is much different. It's an instantaneous loan that you have to pay back and they have high interest rates. Electronic payments are something that has increased. You can actually go through your bank and pay something electronically or you can set yourself up on automatic draft and you really don't even have to go in and, and pay things. And prepay cards are starting to become a really, really big thing. Um, I know, especially as a parent, it, it's really helpful. You can give a prepaid card to a kid and then therefore they have a budget and they have to learn how to use it. A lot of people use prepaid cards to keep themselves on a budget. They'll set a certain amount of money they can spend, put it on the prepaid card and that way when they're out, they're out. So a lot of people use that for budgeting purposes. Uh, now the Fed's biggest, one of its best known roles is for regulating the nation's money supply. Um, it can control how much money is out there in the economy, actually, it really can. Um, and it used several tools. We've got the discount rate, uh, setting reserve requirements, that's how much a bank has to hold back uh, from the deposits before they send it out, uh, setting the federal funds rates target, and using open market transactions like selling um, bonds and things like that or purchasing bonds. So there's two indicators that they use uh, when it comes to money supply. You have M1 and M2. M1 measures funds that are easily accessible or are in or circulation, they're more liquid. M2 includes all of those M1 funds as well as money market accounts and saving instruments. Money market and savings accounts, they're, they're not gonna be as liquid. Um, so that's why we put them in that M2. And so we'll talk a little bit more about those measurements. Uh, now, here's the thing too. Here's this woman, she's looking at, it's probably expensive jewelry. Uh, when interest rates are low, credit's easier to get and people are more willing to buy things. Even, it says luxury goods here too, but even buying a house, when interest rates are low, the real estate market is really hopping. If interest rates go up to 12%, people are probably not gonna buy a house, probably just gonna stay put, because it can really, really change how much their monthly payment is. Here are prime interest rates uh, from 1995 to 2013. And you can see here, we've really been experiencing low interest rates. We really, really have. We had this, this big jump here with the Great Recession, um, but, we've really had low interest rates. And that's one of the things people are questioning now, are interest rates gonna go back up? But I've also seen reports where they're not because with COVID, it just, I just can't see that happening right now. 
And that is six three. Yay. Woohoo. I thought I'd messed up. All right. So come back and we will study six four.